Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Day gong it. The dollar's a goner. The RMB is trading at a 20 year high. Bitcoin is surging toward $200. And gold is heading east. Because for taking down empires, stacking is the new sacking. Oh, if only the United Kingdom weren't such a second rate nation. They'd be more successful like the can do and optimistic Chinese. So said the UK Chancellor George Osborne while on a trade visit to China. Of course, Osborne wasn't referring to his class, uh, i.e. the banking class, for in China, banksters caught committing fraud are not hailed by the state as heroes, but met by a hail of gunfire from the state. No. When George Osborne suggested that Brits are second rate, he was referring to those in the jumper class, the sort that jumps off Apple factories after months of hard, low paid labor. Now that's first rate to a neoliberal potentate. Right, Stacey Herbert? Yes, Max. And you notice George Osborne is kind of a fair weather friend to America because while Dagong was downgrading the US debt, and gold was soaring and heading east, he was over there in the east as well. He was heading over there with the gold, right? Well, as you say, he, he called Britain second rate. George Osborne says, second rate Britain must rediscover its can-do attitude. Chancellor dismisses suggestions that China has a sweatshop economy and wishes Britain would be more like the communist country. Yeah, well, well I, you know, he wants Brits to work for lower wages. That's why the Bank of England has said they're going to keep interest rates low until employment goes higher. That means that they want wages to, to trend lower, to be on a par with China, so that you have everyone employed but making subsistent wages. It used to be here subsistence farming. It used to be the de rigueur economic model here in Britain under the lords and ladies and kings and queens of the feudal period. Now they wish to return to that as part of neo-feudalism so George Osborne can be piggly wiggly Georgie Porgy putting a pie up on his throne making all sides of commandments all day long and not doing jack nothing. Well, the other thing I want to point out is that he should look in the mirror and look what his government is doing because in China they are a command and control economy just like the UK is command and control economy. But the difference is that in China, they have a sovereign wealth fund. They also have a five-year plan. Here, we have a sovereign debt fund. It's the highest debt ratio in the world to GDP, in the world. And they also have me nearly a five-day plan. They only operate for this to get through this week. As long as house price continues to rise, this week. As long as the markets stay up, this week. That's all they think ahead is five days. All right, well, as you point out, China's got a huge sovereign wealth fund. Britain's got this huge sovereign debt problem and their plans are really minute by minute day by day as a debt aholic they should be going to debtors anonymous and they should be getting on some kind of 12 step program George, oh, George Osborne is powerless over his country's debt and he needs to seek a higher power well it also proves that we do run on a ponzi system here because a ponzi scheme needs constantly to have new money coming in and here we always have a five day plan because that's that's every week you have to get new ponzi's to come into the scheme whereas in china they can plan ahead for five years because they're not running a ponzi scheme yet it, you know they do have a uh, high house prices like here but it's mostly paid in cash now they also have because of their five-year plan, they also have new deals being done with George Osborne. New nuclear reactors will transfer billions of pounds a year from British consumers to France and China. So, you know, he hailed this big deal he did with China for the nuclear power plants here. Well, state-owned China General Nuclear Power joining the equally nationalized Electricity de France, EDF, and constructing a 14 billion pound brace of reactors at Hinkley Point in Somerset. The Chinese will have a minority share in the project, but have made it clear, and George Osborne accepts this, that they should have a controlling interest in future schemes. And for this, Max, he's guaranteed price fixing so that they will make a profit. Uh, right, right. So here you have uh, foreign countries and their state-owned companies, <laughs> their nationalized companies, who are buying into Britain, who is in the process of privatizing these assets. They're 
making them available to foreigners to own. So they've convinced Britons they should sell the NHS, sell the energy company, sell the rail system, sell the education system, sell everything, sell it all to pay the debt. We'll keep racking up the debt. Just keep selling off these assets to who? The welfare states of other countries who will then use that to give their citizens a nice, plump, juicy annual income based on this recurring revenue stream forked over by these hapless Brits. <laughs> well, just to go into the details of what this price fixing is. So the fix due to be announced next week is expected to guarantee to pay double the current electricity price for Hinckley's output for some 35 years, effectively forcing consumers to subsidize the Chinese and French states by about one billion pounds a year. And of course, they're also at the same time simultaneously reducing the subsidies for uh, renewable energies, which are all obviously domestic because it's wind or wave power or energy like that. And as the article in The Telegraph points out, a lot of it has come through propaganda where they're saying, well, renewable energy adds all these costs to our electricity bill. Well, in fact, it's added about 37 pounds to the average 1,225 pound bill, whereas here you're seeing it's going to, they're going to guarantee for the French state and the, and the Chinese state a doubling of your electrics. Right. Bills. Again, once again, it's command and control economics. It's yeah. not a free market competition. They're not going to the low cost provider. They're outsourcing it to a monopolist, a communist state that's going to come in here and take Britain's income, put it in their pocket, and they're going to uh, jack prices higher. And uh, a lot of people are going to be without fuel, without food. Uh, Royal Mail has been privatized in the same way. They gave it all the assets to a foreign governments for their pension uh, schemes. And uh, the UK is essentially going to be a tenant in their own country, tenant consumer in their own country, neo-feudal times here in Britain. Well, <laughs> they, uh, another minister from the UK in the past week was over in America. This is Michael Gove. He's the education minister. Michael Gove, governments must stop lying to children about life chances. Education Secretary says inflated GCSE figures were used in the past to tell pupils they could go to university or get skilled work. So he told uh, the schools here to stop lying to children, that they're actually stupid, they don't, get, they don't deserve the A grades they're getting, and they can't compete in the real world. So, however, I think this is the same thing that we see with the, uh, not only quantitative easing, here they're inflating house prices, in order to lie to the population that they're wealthy and because they're wealthy they could somehow compete with China who is building their sovereign wealth fund through real wealth generation and you see that because they don't have a sovereign debt fund they have a sovereign wealth fund. Yeah well it is propaganda isn't it because in other words George Osborne is engaging in economic policies that are stripping Britons of their national treasures and their income and a lot of people mm -hmm. say to themselves am I stupid and then Michael Gove says yes you are you see it's propaganda He'll, he will convince he agrees with you the education minister agrees with you that you're stupid so when you think that oh I'm being ripped off by George Osborne Unless I'm stupid, then the education minister says, yes, of, yes, you are stupid. So it's a one-two punch, uh, pure propaganda, and it's a wholesale offering of all these national assets to foreign governments in exchange for what can only be described as a B-R-I-B-E. That spells bribe. And another thing about this notion that we can compete is we can't, and that's the proof is in the pudding of the NSA spying on every corporation around the world because their corporations, our corporations, cannot apparently compete. And this is having a blowback we're seeing in this next headline here, NSA revelations kill IBM hardware sales in China. The first shot was fired on Monday. Teradata, which sells analytics tools for big data, warned that quarterly revenues plunged 21% in Asia and 19% in the Middle East and Africa. Wednesday evening, it was IBM's turn to confess that its hardware sales in China had simply collapsed. Every word was colored by Edward Snowden's revelation about the NSA's hand-in-glove collaboration with American tech companies from startups to Macedons like IBM. Yeah, well, this is uh, interesting because it shows the commercial impact of the spying scandal. Ultimately, the idea that spying is making people more secure is going to backfire because competitively America's crashing and it won't have any money at all to buy even a slingshot, much less a cruise missile, because no 
foreign government will do business with them. And China, of course, has trillions of dollars in reserves. And like Warren Buffett brought, bought into IBM at the high 170s. He had a nice run, but now it's back to what he paid for. He famously says he only buys things that he understands. Hey, Warren, do you understand corporate espionage? <laughs> Well, you know how China has said that they're preparing for a de-Americanized world. I think that's what you also saw with George Osborne over there in China, just as Daegong, their state uh, credit rating agency, downgraded U.S. debt. We also see that in the NSA thing, I think, is that they've abandoned America because they're just looking to front run other corporations, what they're doing. Now, the consequences here, the numbers on IBM, just to show you how catastrophic and sudden this collapse in sales was to China. In China, which accounts for 5% of IBM's total revenues, sales dropped 22% with hardware sales, nearly half of IBM's business there, falling off a cliff, down 40%. Now, the CEO of IBM had only recently stated that they expected sales to be double-digit growth. So he was unable on this uh, the conference call with investors to even explain what had happened. But of course, he's not going to publicly state it's the NSA spying on our competitors, which have destroyed our market in China. Yeah, well, first of all, I think the CEO of IBM currently is a woman. And this is setting up the situation where IBM will need a bailout. So it, it we go from banks needing all kinds of bailout to high tech corporations needing bailouts now. IBM and the biggest will need, oh, we need a huge bailout for these companies too, paid for by massive amounts of debt. Oh, 17 trillion, 20 trillion, 47 trillion. How about the monthly quantitative easing going from 85 billion to 100 billion, 150 billion? Where does it stop? It won't stop at all because the Ponzi scheme has to get wider and wider and wider. Pyramid scheme means the base of the pyramids is bigger and bigger and bigger. And the purchasing power crashes. The American people are gonna wake up one day and say, oh my God, we sold all of our assets. British people wake up one day and say, oh my God, George Osborne sold all of our assets. All I got here is a cup of noodles left over from some Chinese mergers and acquisition banker who's on his way back to Peking to spend my freaking money. <laughs> no. uh, let me use the correct <laughs> pronunciation, by the way. Beijing, okay? Uh, that dates me. Because when I was growing up, we used to say Peking. But no, 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 no. Now it's Beijing. Oh, it's Beijing. That brings me back to this IBM story because here you have uh, George Osborne saying we need to compete with China. Osborne can't even spell IBM. <laughs> His brain's not worth a plum nickel on the brain exchange. All right, Stacey, we've got to go. Thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Stay tuned for the second half, a whole lot more. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Dan Collins of the ChinaMoneyReport.com. Dan Collins, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. Great to be here. All right, Dan Collins, according to an editorial in a local Chinese paper, China wants to, quote, de-Americanize. Tell us about who wrote this, in which publication, and who the editorial speaks for. Sure. The, ed uh, the piece was written by a uh, respected journalist here in China uh, by the name of Liu Chang. He's writing for Xinhua, which is really the uh, chi new China news agency, really some similar to what Reuters would be. And what the piece he's writing about would never really be uh, spoken as an official mouth uh, piece by the government. However, it really speaks for 1.3 billion Chinese and, uh, frankly, for most of the world. In the piece, he talks about uh, uh, asked to de-Americanize the world, which brought shock uh, uh, and a lot of uh, mainstream media press on it. He's calling for, basically, in the article, Wall Street reform, uh, new reserve world currency and highlights that uh, the Americans have now lost the moral high ground globally uh, with all of the drone attacks, the tortures, and now the recent scandals with spying on world leaders. Um, the first part talks about Wall Street reform. I think most people in the world would, would agree. The United States uh, and the UK, we've done nothing to actually restructure the financial system since the, the first financial crisis. We still have 700 trillion in derivatives out there waiting to crash the markets the next time. And we continue to just uh, respond to this crisis by handing more and more money to banks. Uh, and this is the type of uh, activities he's calling against. The second point on the currencies, he's talking about the world needs a new reserve currency. Why have the Chinese been set up as the world's workers and the Americans set up as the world's consumers? You know, the United States now has 90 million people of working age that are not in the workforce. China, on the other hand, has the highest math and science scores in the world out of, out of China. They have a workforce, 
now of 700 million people, which is seven times the workforce the United States has. So he really questions why uh, you know this situation has taken place, why Americans have exorbitant privilege on the currency and are not uh, supposed to pay for anything that they import. He talks about eventually how uh, there needs to be a new world, world reserve currency backed by gold or something else. And, uh, yeah, this is the main points of the, the article. All right, Dan Collins, so let's talk about the delicate relationship here, the symbiotic relationship between China and the U.S. China, of course, has built their growth on exports to the U.S. Uh, and taking advantage of a cheap labor pool once they entered the World Trade Organization. And the U.S. sends them dollars. They have uh, more, more than a trillion dollars in reserves. They have more than close to four trillion uh, in currency of various currencies uh, in their strategic reserve fund or their, uh, their national reserve fund. But if they are to de-Americanize the world, presumably they want to sever this symbiotic relationship. This means that their export growth would be affected. A lot of the assumptions of the past few years would be completely reversed. And are they ready for the fallout? And are they taking uh, precautions for that fallout? You mentioned gold. Uh, a lot of people speculate that China is very aggressively buying gold uh, in anticipation of the day when the world is de-Americanized and the world no longer uses the dollar as the world reserve currency. Your thoughts? Absolutely. China knows they need to reform, uh, and they're, they're working on this, uh, you know, behind the scenes. Uh, China's foreign currency reserves, as you mentioned, have reached a record, almost $4 trillion. It's up $100 billion in the third quarter alone. However, they have stopped buying U.S. Treasury since 2008. 2008, they had $1.15 trillion in U.S. dollar. Today, they have about $1.3 trillion. So a real modest rise, considering... China has added almost two trillion dollars in currency reserves since 2008 alone, but only you know 200 billion in U.S. dollars. Uh, well, so, Dan, uh, let, me, let me jump in here for a second because people talk about the world experiencing at the moment a currency war, and a lot of people don't understand how you can have a currency war. Uh, Warren Buffett has mentioned weapons of mass financial destruction. Many people don't understand how a financial instrument can be a weapon of mass financial destruction. But here you have a big editorial in China, which is essentially painting Americans as lazy, as uh, unable to pay their debts, and, you know, basically slamming America. Isn't this similar to what we see in a ground war? Aren't they kind of prepping the population to start hating Americans? I mean, this is part of the propaganda war. You know, America would get the all kinds of uh, boycotts and, and shut the economy off in Iraq before they bombed Iraq. You know, it's part of the propaganda. Are, are, isn't China just starting to prep the population to, to blame America and to ready for this financial war? Isn't this part of the propaganda, Dan? Yeah, I believe that, uh, you know, China, you know, they, uh, they see where the world's going. They're importing gold at frenetic pace. You know, all the 400 trillion tons produced in China annually stays in China. They bring in another 800 uh, ton per year. Uh, they're going to next year going to announce their gold reserves. I think it's going to shock people how much gold they have. What's your fake? What's your best guess on that number? Uh, we, I believe uh, we've run some numbers, uh, roughly uh, 5,000 ton to 6,000 ton. I believe they'll pass the United States holdings, you know, within five years. All right, let me, let me jump in again here. Now, the, talk about propaganda and price propaganda and financial wars. The CEO of Daegong Rating Agency has allied with Egan Jones and Russia's rating agency, Russ Rating, in order to counteract what they consider the overly negative ratings of U.S.-backed rating agencies of various BRIC debt, including China debt. So here we have, for years, the U.S. rating agencies always giving American debt AAA rating or AA rating, and they always give the Brick debts, Brazil, Russia, India, China, lower ratings as part of this attempt to steer global cash flow toward the U.S. dollar. Now, China's saying, wait a minute, we can create our own rating agency and we're going to downgrade America. We're going to upgrade our own debt. Isn't this part of that financial propaganda war? And will it be successful, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. These, these rating, global rating, aging, rating agencies today are the enablers of this financial paper speculative economy that's been produced uh, out of the U.S. and the U.K. They realize it's absolutely absurd for the U.S. to be largest international credit rate, uh, debtor to China, but yet China has a lower rating than the United States. 
This makes absolutely no sense. They've called the, these uh, re Western rating agencies as completely impartial and captured by the Western governments. And now they're going to work together to create a new company, Universal Credit Agency, that is going to properly rate uh, West you know, governments globally as well as corporations. All right, Dan, now let's, let's really change gears here for a second and talk about something that I think will shock a lot of people. And that is that China is now the biggest by volume trader of Bitcoin in the world. Uh, Baidu, the, uh, essentially the, uh, one of the biggest internet companies in China is now accepting Bitcoin. And uh, Bitcoin, is, we, we saw what happened in Cyprus when Cyprus started the bail-ins. Bitcoin shot up to 240. We, we know that in, in Venezuela, in Argentina, there's huge Bitcoin activity due to the instability of those governments there. But if China, with 1.2 billion people, they decide that Bitcoin is on a par with gold and, and silver, which they should, and they capture the Bitcoin market, how much of a game changer is this? Because Bitcoin, unlike everything else America does, cannot be hacked. The NSA can't hack it. The FBI can't hack it. It's a, it's a good, good money. You can't hack it. It's, is this a game changer, Dan Collins? Well, I, I think absolutely. I think China's looking for alternatives, obviously, to, obviously to this U.S. dollar reserve system. Uh, Chinese private savings, in addition to 3.7 3 trillion in foreign currency reserves, Chinese private sa savings have gone from 1 trillion to 7 trillion in the last 10 years. If just a portion of that goes into Bitcoin, you could, you could see the prices you know, rocket, obviously. Um, not a, you know, China's going to control pricing and everything, gold, Bitcoin, real commodities, which it already controls. So this is just, could, could absolutely be a game changer. Wait a minute, Dan, let's go through that number again. You're saying that Chinese savings rate, have, the, 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 the people, the Chinese people have gone from one to seven trillion over what period of time? In the last 10 years, private savings, just in savings accounts and current accounts in Chinese banks held by Chinese uh, citizens, 10 years, has gone from one trillion to seven trillion dollars. Okay, well, uh, that seems like they they are very well positioned for a currency war in that they have. Uh, what's the debt picture in China? How do they break that down? As a as a country, debt as a percentage of GDP, I think they're roughly thirty percent debt to GDP. Very good number. We do have local local government debt issues, but uh, unlike the United States or UK or Western governments, China is now tackling with real fundamental reform and restructuring of the economy uh, to head off any local government debt issues in the future. Whereas in the U.S., we just continue to, we're going to print more money, we're going to give more money to banks, and we're going to raise debt ceilings until somehow jobs magically appear. All right, let me, let me um, ask you this question. Let's contrast two economies here. In the U.K., the economy was flagging. George Osborne, Warren brought in, helped to buy, and they're reinflating the real estate bubble. And now the prices are up 10% in a month. It's clearly a bubble. It's going to pop. It's going to cause huge problems. Whereas in China, when the real estate market started to get a bit frothy, they increased the mortgage requirement. They raised interest rates. They're managing things in a much different way. They put an emphasis on savings. Is, that a, is, is it a good to, to contrast these two approaches and ultimately, how can the West, how can the America and the UK hope to compete with China if their solution to stimulate growth is to increase debt and China's solution to stimulate growth is to increase savings? Your thoughts? Well, I mean, in terms of the UK, the UK, uh, you know, I think Osborne this week called the UK a second-rate power to China. You know, it's really harsh language, but in reality, you know, there are Chinese provinces within the next five to ten years that will have higher GDPs than the UK. You look at Jiangsu province, Zhejiang province, adjoining Shanghai, that Yangtze River Delta region already has a GDP of 2.5 trillion, which is higher than the UK. So they really are, uh, you know, a bit player. In terms of the US and UK, absolutely, they're trying to reinflate housing bubbles and they've been partially so, you know, successful so far. It's all about them, you know, kicking the can down the road. And nobody in the U.S. or U.K. is focused on production, real investment, savings. And until they do that, China is going to continue, uh, as well as all of East Asia and Asia in general, is continue. The wealth is going to continue to transfer over. The jobs are continue to transfer over to Asia. And we're going to, you know, U.S. and U.K. are going to get larger and larger in debt until nobody believes them anymore and the currencies take a major, major hammering. I don't know if you've done the math on this, but if you uh, add up the uh, personal savings account and the sovereign wealth fund of China, is the economy trading at a discount to cash? 
Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. I think you know uh, China has a lot of assets on their books, uh, a lot of a lot of money tied up now in sovereign wealth funds. There's there's hundreds of billions of dollars that will continue to get put into sovereign wealth funds as opposed to U.S. Treasuries. There, China's looking for any way now to take those excess savings and excess capital and now distribute it across the world. You see, U.S. now or China now is investing in nuclear power plants in the U.K. These are power plants in the U.K. will be 100% owned by the Chinese government. You know, in addition to Manchester Airport, which was just out. You know, so the U.K. now is looking for China to come in and rebuild their infrastructure uh, because, like the U.S. and U.K., we see we can no longer even repair or build new infrastructure in our own countries. All right, Dan Collins, you're going to have to leave it there. Thanks again for being on the Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Dan Collins, of the ChinaMoneyReport.com. If you want to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.